a couple of things I need to mention. First off, I need to mention that, as you see, this is working out pretty good. The people that aren't real fearful, that don't mind sitting over here, it's created a lot of space. Uh, and it's allowed you all to feel comfortable if you distance. So I think that worked out pretty good. All right. Uh, what I need to mention <coughs> is that uh, we uh, have a lot of folks that still do, do not feel comfortable to come back to church. Hopefully they will pretty soon. But uh, I've been making announcements on Sunday uh, once we go on the live stream that we need to continue to remember we have a budget to meet and we have bills to pay, electric and air and all the good stuff that we have that God has blessed us with. And um, we uh, have three ways of, of giving to the church. Uh, one is if you're here, just drop it in the uh, offering plate in the back. Uh, secondly, you can go online and give online. And thirdly, if you want to just uh, put it in uh, the U.S. mail, we hope we'll get it. Uh, so that will arrive at 1616 Hagee Road. Uh, for those that aren't able to get out and come to church. Uh, I put out a robocall uh, yesterday uh, about a, a special offering that we needed to, to do. How many of you received that? Raise your hands. Okay, most of you, good. I was gonna tell you, be sure and designate it to its cause, okay? Uh, and just put uh, the name of it on there and uh, uh, you can uh, give it to Harold Martin this morning if you plan on it. If you're, if you're online, you can mail it in, just designate it for its purpose. So let me mention that to you. Man, I hate this, this virus, don't you? This election infection is about to kill me. I mean, you can't even, it's just hard to get around and even communicate with everybody. But uh, hopefully it'll be over soon. <clears throat> If we still have a country left by the time they put the new Supreme Court justice in, uh, I just thought it was kind of arrogant that the one that just left us thought that she could uh, say that she would prefer. It's not her business. Uh, it's, the, it's the Constitution of the United States that we're looking at, and we, we've got to quit crossing over with our Constitution and start doing what's supposed to be done. It's been abused enough uh, with all the rioting and stuff that's going on. But anyway, <clears throat> that's just the way it is. Um, let's see, is there anything else I needed to mention? Don't think so. So, if you'll turn in your Bibles to Acts, Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, and I want you to turn to chapter 16. And when you have found your spot, let's stand in honor of God's word. I want to preach to you on the subject this morning of the power of praise. The power of praise is what I want to talk about this morning. Uh, we don't do nearly enough praising God. We, we need to make that a habit, not just on Sunday, but it needs to be a habit daily. Your life will go a lot smoother if you learn to praise God. No matter what the circumstance, no matter what the situation. Somebody told me just recently they got up and they were so depressed and they decided they were going to take some time and pray. <laughs> That's nice to do, you know. So they took some time to pray and they said, man, you wouldn't believe how relieved I felt after I prayed. Well, you know, that shouldn't be an option for a Christian. That should be something we automatically do. And we need to thank God for every day that we draw breath. All right. I'm going to begin reading in chapter 16 with verse 25. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all of the doors were opened, and everyone's uh, bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison Awaking out of his sleep and seeing that the prison doors opened, drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. And then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before 
Paul and Silas. So let's pray. Father, we ask that you would just bless the reading of your word today. We ask God that we can glean from it. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and be seated if you will. There's, in the King James Version, there's 13 midnights in the Bible. I was uh, thinking that a really good series would be the midnights of the Bible. But that's for another time and another place. But this is a, a, a midnight situation that we have here in Acts chapter 16. And we're going to learn some lessons from it. But before we go there, I want to mention a couple of the other midnights of the Bible. Uh, and Moses said in Exodus 11:4, Thus said the Lord, about midnight will I go out into the midst of Egypt. To do what? We see this in Exodus 12, 29. It says that, and it came to pass that at midnight the Lord smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sat on his throne unto the firstborn of the captive that was in the dungeon and all the firstborn cattle. We're all familiar with the Passover, that story. And then we have other midnights in the Bible. One of the midnights that I feel that we are uh, very, should be very much aware of is the midnight cry because I think the midnight cry is getting ready to come and the church is going to be raptured out of this mess that we're in. And Matthew 25, 6, and at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. And someday, soon, I believe, we're going to go out and meet the Lord. We see some things going on right now in our world uh, that tells us that the signs are complete, that we don't have to wait on any more signs. We don't have to wait on much more because everything is set up for God's return. Uh, we're living in a nation that uh, is in peril. Uh, you know, we uh, have been fighting with uh, all of the political situations. We've been fighting with the communists on the street. Uh, and we have been fighting with uh, these states that want to do away with their police departments, uh, don't want to have anything to do with law enforcement. I mean, this is just insanity. And you think, where does this insanity come from? It comes from the people that live in the end of days, and we're living in the end of days. And then California wonders what happens. They promote pedophile last week, and they're burning down this week. I don't, I don't think God will put up with much more with that state out on the West Coast. I think that state is full of demons that are in power. And just like in New York City, uh, when the uh, board got up and they clapped and they applauded the fact that they were going to kill babies at full term. In other words, murder those children when they were uh, ready to come out of the womb. And then in Virginia, you got the demon governor there. And he, that's what he is. He's demon possessed. And I, I'm hoping he's listening. You're demon possessed. Come out, Bobo. But anyway, the fact of the matter is the governor of Virginia is demon possessed. Anybody that would say you could take a baby out, a born child, and put it on a table and wait and get permission from the parents whether they want it to live or to die has got a demon in them. And we see that that's going on. And we, we are told, according to the scriptures, that in the end of days, demon activity will be increased magnificently. And we see that today in our United States of America. We see that in the United States of America that there is demonic influence in our government. There's demonic influence in the uh, news media. There's demonic influence with the movie industry. There's demonic uh, influences everywhere you look. Who would have ever thought 10 years ago that we'd have a network on TV that promotes pedophilia, having 10, 11, 12-year-old girls doing horrible sexual acts and calling it normal. Let me tell you something. We've got a problem in America, but I think the problem is Jesus is getting ready to come soon. We're living in the midnight hour in this country. We're right now in the midnight hour of the United States of America. And usually the midnight hour means that 
destruction is getting ready to come, just as in the Passover. At midnight, the death angel would come, the death angel would move, the death angel would kill any of the firstborn where there was not a blood covering on the door. So that was a midnight hour, and that was a horrible time for Egypt. But yet they were warned and warned and warned. And that's what's going on now. We're being warned and warned and warned that Jesus is going to bring his wrath upon this nation. And we sit back and we're asleep in Zion, as the Bible says. But anyway, the power of praise. Now, no matter what's going on in our lives, no matter what situation that we find ourselves in, if we just realize who we are as the children of God and praise God, then God relieves much of the burden off of our heart. There is power in praising the Lord. We praise Him. We give Him honor. We give Him glory. And when we praise Him, there are certain things that take place. Praise will call, cause us, first of all, to recognize the full sovereignty of God. We realize who God is, and then we can truly praise Him for who He is when we realize He's in charge of all situations, not just uh, surprised by we human beings when we sneak up on Him and surprise Him with someone. That, that doesn't happen. God is sovereign, and we have to realize that praise will cause us to recognize the sovereignty of God. Secondly, praise will enable us to resist the devil. And allow me to say that we are in a spiritual battle right now. We need to resist the devil, and the primary way to resist the devil that we find in the Word of God is through praise, giving praise to God. He hates the name of Jesus. The devil hates the name of Jesus because he knows what his ultimate end is. One preacher said he is the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Now that will get the devil a little bit upset right there. He, and then we see that He is the keeper of the creation and the creator of all. He is the architect of the universe and the manager of all times. Oh, He always was, He always is, and He always will be. He is truly God. And unmoved, unchanged, undefeated, and never undone. He was bruised and He was brought, and He has brought healing. He was pierced and eased pain. He was persecuted and brought freedom. He was dead and brought life. He is risen and brings power. He reigns and brings peace. The word can't under, the world cannot understand Him. The armies can't defeat Him. The schools can't explain Him him away. The leaders can't ignore him. Herod couldn't kill him. The Pharisees couldn't confuse him. And the people couldn't hold him. Nero couldn't crush him. Hitler couldn't silence him. The New Age movement can't replace him. Oprah can't explain him away. Neither can the Democrats, amen. They can take him out of uh, the Pledge of Allegiance, but they can't take him out of being alive and real. And he is, uh, he is light, love, longevity. He is the Lord. He is the Savior. He is holy, righteous, mighty, powerful, and pure. He is our mighty God. He died on an old rugged cross to bring life to you and to bring life to me. And the devil hates it. The devil hates it. But that's what praising God is about. It's bragging on Jesus. It's bragging on our God, our Savior. So a scriptural church is a praising church. We make fun of Baptists being dead sometimes. But let me tell you something right now. If, if you're a dead church, you're not a praising church. Now, there's different methods of praise. I won't go there this morning. Don't have time. But if we're truly a church that loves the Word and loves God, we are a praising church. Now, if a person's uncomfortable with praise, they're going to be uncomfortable in heaven. I'll tell you that right now. If you're uncomfortable when praise breaks out in a congregation, if you get nervous when people start praising God, praising Jesus, then you're going to be very uncomfortable in heaven. Amen. A church service on the Lord's day is a feast. It's not a funeral, but yet we make a funeral out of most services. You know, some church is just absolutely amazing. How can you be so dried up and so dead? How, how can you be, go in and talk about Jesus and talk about what He's done for you and just be dried up and dead? I shared with you before about a pastor that had the gall to borrow 
a casket from the local funeral home. And he brings the casket in and he puts it up in front of the church and says, This morning I want to preach to you. I'm going to talk about the autopsy of a dead church. We're going to do an autopsy of a dead church. And he dealt with certain things that the, uh, that the, the corpse is always dressed nice. It's always quiet. And he goes on and he's talking about the corpse. At the end of the service he raises the casket and he says, Now come up and view the dead church. And he had a big mirror right in the bottom of the casket. As people come by, they would look in there. Now, that would take some guts. I don't, I don't know if he stayed at that church or not. I'm kind of doubting it. But the fact of the matter is, churches that have the living God, the Holy Spirit in them, and I don't care what brand you put on them, if they've got the Holy Spirit in the church, then we are praising God. A live church is a praising church. Now, a funeral service is always quiet. We should never mistake worship service for it. Um, <laughs> in 1 Thessalonians 5.18, we're told in everything to give thanks. Now, what, what took place here? Paul and Silas had been arrested because this little demon-possessed girl was following them around. Basically, what she was, she was, <clears throat> she was one of these uh, uh, fortune tellers. And she was dancing and followed Paul and Silas around, the demon in her was anyway. And all this was taking place and, and Paul just turned around and said, come out, boom. And all of a sudden she couldn't fortune tell no more, the demon was gone. But she affected the pocketbooks of a lot of people that was making a lot of money off of her fortune telling. And after that took place they were beaten, they were thrown in prison. And that's where we pick up the story this morning. Paul and Silas are at the midnight hour. Uh, they, uh, they could have been pouting. They could have been sitting around in that cell and, oh, why did this happen to me? Why, oh, everything bad happens to me. This is just terrible. But they weren't pouting. They were praising. They were praising God at the midnight hour. Now, we talk about the midnight cry when Christ is coming back for his church. But keep in mind, there are positive things about the midnight hour. One of the midnights in the Bible is where Ruth came in and she lay at the feet of Boaz at the midnight hour and to bring comfort, and it was a, a custom of the day. It wasn't anything sexual about it. And she ends up finally marrying Boaz. But the fact of the matter is, much of the midnight hour is negative, but here Paul and Silas are going to make something positive out of the midnight hour. Now, praise will cause us to recognize the sovereignty of God. He and He alone is master of all circumstances. Don't ever think that we're ahead of Him. Don't ever think that He doesn't know what's going on. Don't ever think that His providence is not real. Because His providence is perfect and His plan is perfect even though we may not understand it at the time. But we see that, uh, that, that a lot of folks in the modern church are serving a God that serves them. That they are in command of God. Now that's not the God that we read about in the Bible. That's, that's not the God that we study about in the Bible. How can anyone one serve a finite God? How can anyone serve a God that doesn't know everything? You know, I've heard preachers say, well, I believe in the omnipotence of God, the omniscience of God, the omnipresence of God, but he don't know who's going to get saved and who's not. Does that make any sense? How's he going to know when the last person is called home? The last person that is quickened by the Holy Spirit. How's he going to know that if he's not in charge? How can he be God if any works is left up to us? He can't be. Therefore, God is in control. He is, not, he is not finite. He is infinite in all things. He is perfect in all things. His providence covers all things. But we're able to worship God because of Romans 8, 28. It says, all things work together for the good of those that uh, are called and that love God and are called according to His purpose. We read that and we take comfort in that verse, but oftentimes it don't work out the way we want it to. I preached last Sunday morning on when you feel that your prayers are not heard. And that happens quite a bit. But the jailer 
who had earlier beat them had an appointment, an appointment made before the foundation of the world. That night in prison, it was appointed for him to ask the question, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to be saved? Oh, don't you wish more people would ask that question? Don't you wish more people would look to God and, and look to him for salvation? But I tell you, I found out my many years of preaching that doesn't work that way. You know, I was going to be the next Billy Graham. I was going to get up and preach and everybody was going to get saved. They were just going to come to the altar and I was going to tell them to go to the church of their choice. And then I opened a church over in Virginia and I called it the church of your choice and nobody came. <laughs> There was a church out the road here called, uh, called uh, Abundant Living. And people used to ask me, where do you pastor? I said, Defeated Living Baptist Church. <laughs> and then, of course, I, I would make it right, of course. I was just being silly like I can be sometimes. But anyway, the fact of the matter is, we know that God is in, in control of this thing. We, we don't have to... To, to worry about it. This jailer had an appointment with God. Just like the woman at the well. Jesus said what? I must, what? I must go through Samaria. Just like at the pool of Bethesda. When Jesus walked in, he walked by all the crippled, the lame, the blind, the sick, and he goes to one certain man that was crippled laying by the pool. And he says, do you want to be made whole? And the man looked up, and of course, what kind of answer did he give? Of course, he'd been crippled since birth. And Jesus says, take up your bed and walk. And he did so. Well, the amazing thing about that is that the one was healed. But people want to argue, well, why in the world wasn't everybody at the pool made whole? Because that wasn't God's plan, and God has a plan. God has a perfect plan, and his plan will come to fruition. Uh, I, you know, every now and then I, I miss an appointment. I, not lately, I haven't missed many because my cell phone helps out a little bit. Uh, Obama got me a cell phone, by the way. Uh, cost me about 300 some dollars a month. I'm trying to find that free cell phone that was given out, but I hadn't been able to find it yet. But anyway, uh, the, the, the fact of the matter, the... Associational Secretary was having an anniversary, and I was invited to come and to kind of MC and to take care of it, and uh, Rosalind and I were very close friends, still are very close friends, uh, one of the nicest people I've ever known, one of the most godly Christian people I've ever known. And anyway, I was supposed to be there. Well, I get a telephone call on my cell phone. Man, that was a long time ago. Well, my daughter Kim and her boyfriend at the time, and my grandson Josh, Josh was on the back of a big inner tube behind the boat out at Boone Lake, and I was sitting up front with Kim and her boyfriend at the time. My phone rings. I said, hello. Where are you, Alan? You're supposed to be over here for Rosalind's 25th anniversary. I missed an appointment. You ever missed an appointment? Most of us, and, and isn't it terrible when you miss an appointment? Uh, I know one, one lady that's missed about two here lately. I don't know if it has anything to do with her eyesight or not, but, <laughs> but she, she's been, and I love it when you get a call, right, Julie? Hey, this is Julie. Where are you? Oh, was it today? <laughs> but we human beings, <laughs> We, we human beings miss appointments. I want to tell you right now, but let me tell you something. Jesus, God, the Holy Spirit never misses an appointment. Amen. It was this jailer's time. It was time for him to be brought into the kingdom of God. And the jailer uh, who had earlier beat them had an appointment at midnight. God, uh, God's appointment book was filled before the foundation of the world, according to my Bible. And maybe he's got an appointment with somebody here this morning. Maybe it's your time. Maybe it's your day to be saved. But God's appointment book is called the Lamb's Book of Life. Had a cert, it had a certain jailer's name that was written in that book. And uh, 
at, at this night, he had a visit from the Holy Ghost. And uh, the circumstances were dark at the midnight hour for Paul and Silas, yet we know he's an on-time God. I love that song. He's an on-time God. Yes, he is. Mm. Well, never mind. I, I'd like to get into some praise here, you know, a little singing, but I don't want to scare you all to death. But the fact of the matter is, we see that uh, Paul and Silas uh, were at the right place at the right time under really bad circumstances. And what were they doing? They were praying and they were praising God. You know, it's easy to praise God when things are going good, isn't it? It's easy to praise God when you're sitting in Krispy Kreme donuts with a dozen hot donuts before you and a big pot of coffee. I mean, that's good times. Now, I am praise Jesus, you know, and put another pound or two on. But it's easy to praise God sometimes. But let me tell you uh, this morning, sometimes it's not easy to praise God. Now, take in mind what's going on here. These men have been beaten, they're in prison, and the very jailer that probably did a lot of the beating and a lot of the abuse to these two men was going to be saved and become brothers with them. Good night. That's what God does. When God saves us, he makes us brothers with those we wouldn't have anything to do with before. So thank God that he is able to change the most base sinner and to make him clean and make him white as snow. Circumstances sometimes get dark for us. That's when we need to praise the Lord. That's when we need to sit back and praise God no matter what's going on around us. Paul and Silas were not only relieving their troubles, but they were instrumental in witnessing to all of these lost people that was in the jail that night. But they were praising God because they recognized His sovereignty. They knew that He was in control. Here's something else that praise does. Praise will enable us to resist the devil. Oh, I don't have no problem with the devil. You need to get saved then. Anybody that tells me that they never are come under attack, spiritual attack, and if they're church people, they ought to really examine themselves. Amen. Because the devil will not leave you alone if you're a child of God. He will bring issues into your life. He will bring problems. Oftentimes, they're chastening problems. Sometimes they're growing issues where he wants us to grow more. But the devil will not leave you alone if you are truly a child of the king. So, we see that Satan attempted to silence Paul, uh, to silence Paul and Silas just as he attempts to silence us. Now, a lot of folks say, well, I've tried that. It doesn't seem to work. Well, if you're depressed, try this. Read your Bible. Try this. Uh, pray. Try this. Sing a song of praise. And, and if you can't sing a lick, go ahead and sing it anyway because nobody's going to hear you but God, and he loves the praise of his people. The Bible says it's a sweet smell before his nostrils when we praise him. And we don't have to even sing on key as long as it's from the heart, as long as we're praising him. Uh, do, do, do you attend church? You know, one of the things that absolutely kills me are these people that are going, I'm really going through a hard time, Peter. You are? Well, I haven't seen you at church lately. No, I just don't feel like coming. My goodness, that's when you ought to want to be in church with God's people. If you're in the right kind of church, when troubles come, you want to be with your, uh, with your fellowship. You want to be with your friends. You want to be with your church family. You want to be there so they can lift you up in prayer, so they can be there for you and give you encouragement and get encouragement not only from your fellowship with your friends, but encouragement from the Word of God, encouragement to go on and to move forward in life. These folks that quit coming to church the first time a little storm comes their way really worry me. I, I, I don't know exactly where they're coming from. But uh, Satan attempted to silence Paul and Silas, just as he attempts to Silas says, I don't feel good this morning. So I don't think I'm going to. Don't feel much like praising anything. You ever get up with that kind of mood? Let the younger ones do the praising. I'm too old. 
I did my praising, you lying dog. If you can't praise God when you're old, you didn't praise God when you were young. You hear me? Don't, don't lie to people. Well, I used to praise God. I used to shout. Why don't you do it now for crying out loud? I, I don't understand that concept. Yeah, the young people, they got more energy than I do. Well, how can the young people praise God if the adults have never taught them what praise is about or never praised God themselves? In other words, children do what they're taught. Kids love to be active, and they love to lift their hands, and they love to make noise. But what do we do? When, when one of them starts to, uh, to do something in church, shh, shh, be quiet. And I know it can sometimes get annoying, you know, with a baby crying or something like that. But if a kid wants to laugh, laugh out in church, if they want to raise their hand and praise, leave that, leave that child alone. Amen. Let them learn to praise, because you haven't taught them anything. So let them learn to praise God. And God wants the praise of his family. Yeah, well, I'm too old to praise God. I used to praise him. Well, you may be too old to climb up and clean the steeple, but you're not too old to praise God. Let me just put it to you that way. Uh, let the younger ones do it. Let the older ones do the praising. They ought to know how. <laughs> Any excuse to get out of praising God. <laughs> let, let the deacons praise a while. I'm not in the mood. Let the preacher make a fool out of himself yelling and hollering. I'll sit here and maintain my dignity. <laughs> think, think about the reasonings that I'm maintaining my dignity by acting like this is a funeral service rather than a worship of the living God. Let the preacher make the fool out of himself. There are dead Christians and dead churches all over this city and all over this country that say they serve the living God. But they've got dignity. They've got dignity. You know, sometimes God tells you to do crazy things. And God just told me to do something crazy. I've heard about this before, but I didn't think it would ever happen to me. I hate to do this to y'all. Hallelujah. I've lost my dignity, but I don't care. I believe God told me to do that, to show some of you dignified people that your preacher ain't as dignified as you are. Now, if he calls me to go run around the church yelling, I don't know if I'll do that or not. My wife's over there saying, do it one more time. She's trying to kill me. You know, people, when people get into praise mode, they're not going to worry about what anybody else thinks about them. You know, and, if, the, and if, any, if anyone is in the church that wants to criticize somebody that gets in praise, that shouts, that rejoices, that praises God, then, man, they ought to examine themselves. Ought to examine themselves. And I know why a lot of people don't like to be vocal, because they've known so many stinking hypocrites that have been vocal. But if you're not a hypocrite, don't worry about being vocal. We used to have a shouter where I grew up. She used to scare the Gehenna out of me. My mom and dad sat, they had three rows. Mom and dad would sit over here, and she would sit right back here. And... You didn't know when it was coming. You know, mo most of these shouters, they got a particular verse in a song that they'll start shouting. You know, when they hit that, uh, like, He's got on the mountain. Woo! <laughs> Next week, He's got on the mountain. Woo! 
They time it just right, you know. But you never knew when she was going to shout. She would scare you to death. <laughs> My mom ran into her daughter years later. And uh, she was talking to her. She said, I didn't speak to my mom the last 15 years of her life that she's the meanest woman I ever knew. <laughs> mom said, really? <laughs> I can't imagine what she must have thought when she told her that. But praising God, I mean, it's that, when David danced before the Lord, you're lucky I didn't get naked this morning. Dance. <laughs> well, hey, didn't David do it? I've got on a loincloth. I'm messing with y'all now. You know that. <laughs> Marcus, please don't. <laughs> Oh, Lord. Anyway, but David, the Lord told him to dance through the streets. And some say he had a loincloth on. I don't know what he had on. But anyway, he didn't have much on because Michael got really upset at him. And uh, the, 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 the language that is used there with him dancing in the street says that he was... Uh, that he was, had given himself over to total abandonment of self. All right? Y'all follow me? In other words, he was dancing and he was praising and praising God and he was worshiping God because the ark had come back. God had come back into Jerusalem. Think about it just for a second, okay? So he was rejoicing and dancing. And old Michaels was like some of these hypocrites. I saw you out there making a fool out of yourself, dancing around naked so the young girls could lust over you. That's basically what she said, by the way. God shut her womb up, pow, just like that. And that's one of the most horrible things that could happen to a Jewess, is, that, is to have her womb shut. And her womb was shut from that moment on. So if God is telling you to worship and to praise with, with, with not worry about what anybody else is thinking or what anybody else is doing. God will take care of that. But if we praise God, it will enable us to resist the devil. Let's get back to the point here. Um, don't let the devil rob you of the power of praise. Now, Satan wants to silence our praise because he can't take it. Anytime we praise God, it upsets the dark kingdom. When, when, when we praise God in true worship, in spirit and in truth, it upsets the devil. Now, the only people in church that are uncomfortable with praise are the biblical illiterate, the spiritual ignorant, or the people that's lost, one of the three. So if anybody gets upset with praise, they got a problem. Somebody ought to praise the king and glorify the king of heaven every time we open these doors. We ought to rejoice to be here on Sunday morning. I, I'm, I'm happy to be here. Amen. There's a lot of churches that aren't even meeting yet, and I'm happy to be here. Somebody ought to praise the king. Somebody ought to shout uh, he is the king of glory. Somebody ought to shout, I'm in love with Jesus. I praise Jesus. I love Jesus. I thank you for the blood that he shed at Calvary. I want to glorify him this morning. I want to give him my whole heart, my whole soul. I want to yield myself to him completely. And I don't care what anybody else thinks or anybody else does. Yes, now that's how we ought to love the Lord. And then thirdly, when God's people praise... It will release the Spirit of God. When you praise God, it will release the Spirit. Satan wasn't the only one hearing the praise. God was also listening as they were praising. Whatever the song was 
that they were singing in that jail, whatever that song was, I'll guarantee you it wasn't mama looking down through the floor, floor cracks of heaven. No. I guarantee you it wasn't if working and praying can do anything, Lord. No, no, no. No, I, I don't think that song was being sang. I, I don't think, why me, Lord? What have I ever done to deserve even one? I don't think that song was being sung. No, I think hallelujah to the lamb might have been being sang. I think nothing but the blood of Jesus may have been, been being sang in that jail that night. Giving praise to Jesus, not to mama, not to yourself, but to Jesus Christ. And that's who Paul and Silas were praising in the prison that night at the midnight hour. It was a song, I bet, that was praising the lamb, that was praising the blood that was shed, that was praising the old rugged cross that he hung on, was praising the resurrection when he burst forth from the grave on the third day as the first fruits to those of us that would follow at the appointed time would be resurrected not by our power, but by the power of a holy God who showed that power when he came out of the grave. And that's what we look forward to as believers. We look forward to life after life in the presence of Jesus, the one who died for me and the one who died for you. That's what praising God is about, for what he's done, not for what we do. But the foundations of hell would be shaken if we would learn how to praise God on Sunday mornings. If we would come in rejoicing not getting all this garbage off of our minds. You come in here, you got, got everything but worshiping God on our minds. We need to come into this place and we need to focus. We need to focus on Christ. How can we rejoice this morning? How can we praise him? How can we give praise that he'll honor? How can we give praise that he'll, that, that he'll sense our, that his, his glory through our praise? How can we please him with our praise? What can we do to rejoice in the house of God and to praise Jesus, the one that died for me? Amen. How can we do that? We have to focus. Praise him, praise him, praise him. Praise our precious Redeemer. Prophet, priest, and king. And then lastly, praise will redeem the sinner. You wonder why a lot of young people don't want nothing to do with this church? Because we dead people that's in the church. And they're looking for all these new ways. Looking for, uh, hey, I'll tell you what, we, Marcus, I'll tell you what, me and you need to work together here. We need to get a smoke machine, a, a dry ass machine up here. And then we, we need to get some, some strobe lights and, and try to reach these young people with, with all this craziness and everything. And, and then, Marcus, I'll tell you what, if you'll get a pair of skinny jeans with holes in them, I'll get a pair, all right? Because that seems to draw the millennial crowd in. So I, I'm gonna, and I'm gonna lose a little bit of this stomach, and I'm gonna start wearing a polo shirt, and I'm gonna get my, my I'm, I, I'm, I'm definitely gonna get out my, uh, uh, my, my stool so I can sit down with my skinny jeans and my polo shirt with the lights are blinking in the background, and tell you all what you want to hear, so you'll want to come to church. Biggest church in, in Georgia is Andy Stanley's church, and he's a lunatic heretic. Oh, yeah, that's Charles' son. You say, well, how can you say that about Charles Stanley's son? Because he's a heretic. My greatest dream was my son would follow me in the ministry, and it wasn't God's plan. But I would rather Sonny be in heaven if he's in heaven right now than to be a heretic preaching the lies that Andy Stanley preaches. You say, well, I don't know about that. Well, read sometimes, you know. You can read. Go, go on in there. Andy Stanley, heretic. And it'll tell you why. One thing, he's uh, unhitched, Dustin. He's unhitched the Old Testament from the New. The Old Testament has nothing to do with the New Testament Christianity. Heretic! 
I was in a meeting up in Cleveland, Ohio one time in an all-black church. And I think, Ron, you may have been there at that time. And uh, there was this little preacher got up there, and he started waxing eloquent on oneness Pentecostalism at a Baptist Sovereign Grace Conference. And all of a sudden, <laughs> my, our missionary that we're supporting now, he was sitting up in front of us. He goes, heretic, heretic. <laughs> yeah. And I was in another meeting one time where this guy was preaching heresy, and so Larry Montgomery, and you know how shy Larry, oh Larry is, don't you? He said, "Glory, hallelujah, heretic, heretic," and he walks out of the place. That's the way we ought to handle heretics. But the heretics, some of them have the largest churches in America, cause they got a smoke machine. And they got strobe lights, and they got high powered music, and they wear skinny jeans, and they got a polo shirt, and they sit on a stool. Hallelujah! That's holy nowadays. Oh, pardon me for my getting off track a little bit here, but praise brought conviction on the jailer. There wasn't any strobe lights, there wasn't any, uh, anything fancy whatsoever in that jail cell. But I'll tell you what was in that jail, the power of praise and the power of the Holy Spirit of God. Amen. That's what was in that jail. And when they were singing that praise, uh, praise had brought conviction on that jailer. Now, uh, I'll bet the last two weeks Christians have talked more about, uh, 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 talk, talked more about politics than they have about Jesus. We, we need to quit worrying about politics. Let God work it out. If it's time for America to burn, it's time for America to burn. Just suck it up and burn. Because God's in control. I hope that's not the case. But I got a feeling it will be if things don't go the right way this next election when you've got communists all over our streets burning down buildings and these peaceful protesters. It's just, it's amazing to me. It's amazing to me why we, at the American public, who is the majority, why we're just sitting still and letting them do that. But anyway, look what was taking place. Just the simple thing, simplest things taking, uh, taking place here. Uh, they, they, they were praising Jesus. They were lifting Jesus up. They were talking about Jesus. And do you know in Western Christianity is the only bunch in the world I'm talking about the good old American Christians, the evangelicals, are the only people in the world that talks about Jesus on Sunday and forgets about him on Monday. Most carry him with them. Most places Christians carry him every day with them. Uh, a missionary tells of a man in East India, or an East Indian mother, that is, and her two children. One was weak and feeble. The other one was strong. And she sacrificed the strong one into the Ganges River. The Hindus do that occasionally, you know. Into the Ganges River. And she walked away with the weak child. The missionary said, why did you do that? Why, why, why would you sacrifice your strong child? She said, only the best for my God. Let that sink in. Only the best for my God, who is a false God. Do we give the best to our God? But through lifting up and praising Jesus, the jailer that had beat them earlier, that was now washing and cleaning the wounds that he had put on them. Because he was a new creature in Christ. He got saved at the midnight hour. I'll spare you from singing the midnight hour tonight. Usually if I'm preaching on anything midnight, I sing the midnight hour. <laughs> or Mustang Sally, right, Ron? Anyway, let's stand if you will.